All right, welcome everyone to the X on Bros podcast. Myself, Scholar McClarney, with me is Schoolman Fawcett, and this is Classical Catholic Education in podcast format. We are educators at Chesterton Academy of St. Isidore, the world's only online Chesterton Academy. And if you want to get a taste of the kind of uh, online classical education we provide, well, that's what this podcast is all about. So, what would you like to discuss well, today? Today, I think we're going to get into the topic of justice. And what our intention here to do is speak today particularly about Plato, and then next time about, a, uh, I was going to say Augustine, but uh, Machiavelli. We may come up. He we may come, come up. To, maybe we can get, get to a third segment with, with Augustine, but uh, Machiavelli. And, and so, I guess, I guess, why Plato? Why Machiavelli? I think there's a few reasons uh, why these two. Uh, for one, well, I think you had pointed this out. Uh, uh, Plato sets the stage, really, for ancient philosophy. If you follow Alfred North Whitehead, it's all a philosophy. Mm, it's all <laughs> it's but, it's Plato, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but uh, he certainly helps define the um, parameters mm-hmm. by which ancient philosophy And that's operates. both moral, well, it's really metaphysics as well, but it's also moral philosophy and political philosophy. Yeah. Our, I, terms are set by Plato. And, ways, and, yeah. and they, those two might not be that much different uh, mm-hmm. when, it, when it comes to his thought. True, yeah. Whereas Machiavelli is, sets the stage for modern philosophy in many ways, mm-hmm. b- political and otherwise. And mm-hmm. it's, so they're, mm-hmm. yeah. they're, they're a helpful, uh, I think, uh, points of contrast, uh, yeah. one to the other, for getting a sense of, of mm-hmm. uh, ancient as well as modern philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's Peter Kreeft who says that in terms of, you know, at least political philosophy, but as, as you said, that yeah, it's bigger than that. But the definitive work for the ancient world would have been Plato's Republic. The definitive work for the medieval world would have been Augustine's City of God. And the definitive work for the modern world is, is probably Machiavelli's The Prince. Uh, which is a much more slender book than those two, <laughs> but, right. uh, but is sort of definitive to, you know, for, if you want to understand politics today, you've got to understand Machiavelli. If you want to understand what politics meant for medievals, you've got to read Augustine, and to understand what it meant for the ancients, you, you've got to read Plato. And, and specifically, you've got to read Plato to know what Machiavelli is revolting against. That's right. And if the, talking about the prince being a shorter work, he's reducing the frame by which we understand reality. Yes. Uh, and, and so maybe that's one reason why it doesn't have to be quite as long. But uh, yes. in any case, um, yeah, and so Machiavelli does take exception specifically uh, with Plato. So it's helpful to look at one uh, and then the other. Mm. And this is not, um, I mean, I'm going to say... Plato gives the uh, the Republic, and then Machiavelli, he doesn't call it this, but it's really a new Republic uh, that he's offering. Mm-hmm. It's not simply just about brute force, uh, force rather, but uh, pragmatic realism. So if we use terms like matters of fact, uh, practical truth, mm-hmm. the, uh, the ends justify the means is not actually a direct quote from him, mm-hmm. but the idea is certainly there. Uh, so those ideas... Well, I've, I mean, it's been suggested he says something worse, which is almost like... Uh, the the ends make the means honorable or something like that. Right. right. Yes. So yes. You, justification is almost not even a relevant concept for him. It's is it honorable? All right. As I'm sure we'll discuss. But uh, certainly, yeah. Just like Dostoevsky didn't say exactly that uh, if God does not exist, everything is permitted. But the thought is there. Uh, same with Machiavelli. The idea that the utilitarian instrumentalism is certainly present all through Machiavelli. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yes, and his, his redefinition of, of, of virtue uh, as well. So that would be key. Um, and it's key, know. I'd say, as well, to just, to, just to, in general, you know, classical education, you know, reading the great books, the great books are a conversation, right? It's not just that these books are, you know, important tomes we need to uh, assimilate, oh, right. but, yeah. but, you know, they, they're in conversation with each other, and we need to be in conversation with them. Right. They're, they're responding to each other. They take slightly different perspectives on things. So there, it's an ongoing dialogue civilization. And, and even, you know, and we, you find this even reading Plato's dialogues, as we'll, as we'll do today. You as a reader kind of want to get involved in that argument. Yeah, that's like, right. you, know, yeah. you kind of want to challenge something or yeah. like, you know, I don't quite agree with this or I want to take this side. And that's, I think, exactly what Plato wants you to do. And that is, but you can only do that intelligently if you've really read the classics and you've read the greats and read them in a classical way. So I think putting Plato in conversation with Machiavelli uh, is a very uh, fruitful endeavor, I think. Yeah, and, and I think mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of like sitting around the table, right? Uh, and so we've, uh, here we're, we're, we're sitting around a table, uh, wherever you're listening, mm-hmm. uh, joining us, uh, mm-hmm. you're welcome as well. And 
or literally around like drinks or something which is really what's happening in the republic it's just you know guys at a party basically like sh- sh- sitting around and uh, shooting the breeze about about justice right that's that, yes. that is actually that's that's the ideal model of education as, as leisure right school right. is leisure right oh, okay. culture is leisure so something uh, liberal yes so uh, we can imagine uh, you know a, a dialogue between uh, plato and machiavelli you know maybe it would look something like this and, and of course we can interject ourselves as we're in dialogue with them as well who we agree with more or maybe we agree with some of them on different things in different areas well, we'll delve into that, I suppose. Right. But. And one thing you might do when you're sitting around the table, maybe the family or friends, you might play cards. And uh, if you want to think of it this way as an analogy, there's only so many ways you can play cards. Uh, there's only different... so many permutations. Only That's so many right. hands. And, yeah, and, yeah. And so same thing when we're setting up a society uh, mm-hmm. or, or thinking of what we mean by justice. There's only a certain amount of ways we can play cards or, or, or play down how we're going to set things up. Mm-hmm. Now, sure, we might come up with something new that hasn't yet you know, it will elaborate on something. Chances are, though, we're just building or branching off a trunk that has already been established. So that's mm-hmm. why another reason why this is very helpful to go back and see what mm-hmm. others have said mm-hmm. uh, before us. Uh, and um, here, Machiavelli is probably a household name, maybe a bit lesser known though, as a philosopher mm-hmm. uh, per se, but really a uh, modern statecraft, uh, modern man and woman. Uh, really, we get a lot of our ideas. Uh, from him mm-hmm. and so um, here uh, and that's no small feat that 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 he's doing but all right before we think of uh, well what do we what's the air that we breathe or the assumptions we make let's well, we're gonna look at Plato's Republic here in one second what's the assumptions or background in Plato's time or the Greek world even if we back up a little further we're talking about justice. So here from uh, Hesiod, who's one of the earliest writers uh, for, for uh, Greek writing, we actually have Homer's a little bit older, but nonetheless, when we are listening to Hesiod, he says that he's going to personify justice. He's a poet. He's not a, necessarily a philosopher, uh, although he is, I suppose, uh, but he's depicting these things in poetic, metaphorical form. Yeah, right, and in a full sense of the word poet, poesis, mm-hmm. uh, which is to, to draw together, to make, right, to create. Uh, and so a mythologist, but in his mythology, he says this. It justifies, per, uh, justice is personified. He says this. Justice, the daughter of Zeus, who is honored in reverence among the gods who dwell on Olympus. And whenever anyone hurts her with lying slander, she sits beside her father Zeus, the son of Kronos. And uh, it continues on, you know, justice will be uh, met it out, uh, right? According to Zeus, the who, son of Kronos. Who is Kronos? Dr. Oh, Kronos is the come one of the Titans, uh, right? Original, uh, and his name you're probably familiar with, chronometers maybe or chronology. Uh, chronology, or... that's right. And so, um, uh, let me say that's the word in French at least, chronomate. I don't know if this is in English, but it means a stopwatch. But in any case, um, and so uh, the yeah. The time. That's where we get it from. Uh, Zeus, the son of time. And again, as his name implies, like chronological time, like the passage of time. You know, right. Flowing time. Yeah, right. And so, okay, then now, um, that, that, that's as it. Go forward a, a few centuries. Uh, this is um, Aeschylus, who's, who's one of the uh, poets that our students will read in ninth grade, uh, familiar with uh, the Restia, which is a, a trilogy of uh, tragedies talking about the house of Atreus. And the, uh, if we're familiar with Agamemnon, uh, the play, I and mean, he's the character as well, uh, he's, this is the setting right after the Trojan War. So it's picking up after uh, th- that, that whole episode. And there we see how, well, dynastic tyranny has gone awry mm-hmm. and uh, justice being uh, played out, right, in time. Over time, it takes several generations, right? Mm-hmm. And so this, this does play out. Now, Aeschylus is not just simply creating more myth to be consumed and, and you know get more seats at our tickets at the box office and so on he's actually making uh, a critique and, and and commentary on contemporary athenian politics as he's doing so but again now maybe you're not a big fan of tragedy maybe this mythology thing as well uh, maybe not so much for you there's other thinkers pre-socratic thinkers like pythagoras uh, as well as Democritus in that company, who, um, you know, and I guess in one limited sense, we could call them proto scientists, uh-huh, uh-huh. or, or if you like, natural philosophers. And for them, the the universe has uh, the physical universe is ordered, right? Uh-huh. So there's a logic to it, and 
Democritus is quite interesting because he's a materialist, right? Okay. Uh, he's, he's the one where we get the word um, atomi or okay. atom, something that can't be divided, can't be cut. So the ultimate reality is not God or spirit or something like he that. He doesn't it's, believe in the gods. Exactly, That's right. Yeah. yeah. But he does have faith. Okay, so he does a faith that the material world is ordered, okay. uh, so that it holds, holds patterns, right? Okay. Uh, and, and so that all things will play out in time. Okay. Now, if you think about that term, all things will play out in time, in time yeah. what does that remind us of? Justice's grandfather. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right, Kronos. And so this is the idea that this is a moral framework which allows Democritus uh, to operate in, and, and the other thinkers as well. Uh, so from whether it's um, the beginning of with Hesiod or Homer, what we see with subsequent art, and mythology, and even science, what allows us to flourish is uh, this, this framework, this moral framework uh, in which things are ordered. In reality there's a reason to it and a rhyme all right that works so, itself out in time and that's his, right yeah yeah, yeah. so a very interesting question to consider a backdrop uh it was specifically or particularly if we're thinking of the idea of justice okay now with with that in mind uh, let's say a little bit more about the republic the republic is a platonic dialogue uh, and what do we mean by that by dialogue well, uh, logos is a term that's come up on this podcast a lot. Uh, it means word, but beyond that, it means like rationality or reason, like the meaning behind words. So uh, that's why, you know, today all of our, many of our sciences have, lo it's biology, right? Uh, or sociology. It's, it's the logic, uh, another word that's related to it, uh, the meaning, the science of that. So that's the idea of uh, logos. So a dialogos is a, an exchange of words. You know, yes. it's a back and forth, but yeah. on a deeper level, it's like an exchange of, re there's re it's reasoning together. Come, let us reason together, I guess you could say. Y yeah. Dialogue. And so just as we're exchanging words right now, mm -hmm. uh, as, as we're talking, there, there's literally, you know, the sound waves uh, that, that emanate right from, from mm -hmm. our voice boxes. Well, there, so there's that level, but then on a deeper level, there's also a logos which abides within us. All right. So, so for Plato, we would say that uh, yeah, there there's this element to us that uh, aligns with configures to logos, which is beyond us even. So there's a logos within us. Uh -huh. This goes back to even uh, Heraclitus. But uh, there's a logos within us, right? Uh -huh. That that's getting out through our words, uh -huh. and then we're exchanging that, right? So it's going back and forth, and beyond that. There's also another logos, an objective logos out there that, okay. that, that we then are in tune with as well. So it's okay. not, we're not just talking words here. Uh, as far as Plato is concerned, no, 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 no. Uh, we might be exchanging these uh, words, but they're embedded in ideas, right, which uh, okay. can be within us, but then point to a, a more ultimate reality, uh, mm -hmm. the realm of ideos. Yeah, or, there's, an ultimate, or there's an ultimate rationality to the world itself we have to understand, which is captured in our words. Uh, as we've discussed in other podcasts, uh, that was even called the grammar of the universe, right? Which is why the foundation of classical education is the grammar. It's the first, first st uh, part of the trivium, you know? Right. So, that, and we as rational animals, that's what makes us unique, is that we, because we have a logos within us, we have some kind of connection to, you know, we're microcosms, you know? We have some, you know, like the universe, we can kind of understand it because of the way that we're configured. This is all... Right. Important prelude, I yes, think, yes. to knowing what uh, and, Socrates and Plato were going to be. Up sure. To. And speaking of grammar and, and 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 reading and making sense of what what's you know the basic before us is when people first uh, approach the text. Uh, now uh, with the Republic, how can we say this? Well, if for us, it's a tenth grade that that uh, our students mm -hmm. uh, delve into it. Our, our classes are semesterized, so it takes about a month or so uh, to get through it. Now. It can be read in as little as ten and a half hours. You can go ahead and uh, listen to the audiobook version, and, and you'll get through it. Uh, so uh, maybe you know, get your friends together Saturday morning and uh, have at it. <laughs> yeah, stage a play. You know, basically you assign parts, and you can uh, you can act it out because it is a drama. It, it is, is a play. Yeah. You know. And it is, uh, if you think of it, it's kind of set over the course of a day. Uh, so if you start in the morning, you'll end in the evening, and uh, you'll know, get the full effect, start right before sunrise. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, On a rainy day like we've been having here in Edmonton, what else are you going to do on a Saturday? You can't go out, you know, just stay home and uh, wrestle with the 
topic of justice with your friends you know why not all day so yeah even even the gardeners are going to be staying indoors uh, with, with weather like this so um now with the text uh, there's there's certain layers to it uh, we're going to read here from just a few opening lines Please forgive me if I confuse Socrates with Plato. Uh, when he says I, it is Socrates. Mm -hmm. I'll probably say Plato if I don't catch myself, but I'll, I'll, I'll try, not, uh, try not to make that uh, mistake, even though uh, mm -hmm. the two do blend in. in well, yeah, yeah. They, they, they may, yeah, whether Plato actually agrees with everything Socrates says is actually an open question. Right, right. So uh, this is Plato's work, but we're reading uh, first person in Socrates. So it goes like this, the opening lines. I went down yesterday to the Piraeus with Glaucon, son of Ariston, and I might offer my prayers to the goddess, Mendes the Thracian Artemis, and also because I wanted to see in what manner they would celebrate the festival, which was a new thing. I was delighted with the procession of the inhabitants, but that of the Thracians was equally, if not, more beautiful. All right. Now a few things. Uh, let's take stock of these a uh, uh, little bit here, the opening. The first term I went down in Greek, it's katabasis. It's the uh, movement which we see in other works of literature. Uh, uh, the hero's journey is what Joseph Campbell calls it. Uh, I think it's a little bit broader than how Campbell might understand it, but from the dawn of Western civilization, starting with Gilgamesh, all the way, well, more recently, let's see, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or uh -huh. we're talking about Bilbo leaving the Shire and delving down to the the deer of the misty mountains uh right or you maybe it's uh luke wire uh, luke skywalker leaving uh -huh. the uh, uh tatooine right this uh -huh. is this is crossing a threshold so it do which that should tell you it doesn't necessarily always mean literally a descent uh, although it might in something like a uh, well in dante right <laughs> literally you can't get right. up the mountains yes the yeah. only way up there is to go down into hell and then come out the other side but really what it means is it, sometimes it's an ascent up into the sky into the star wars uh, but what it means is that you're leaving your comfort zone you know, right. sa safely perched up there and you're descending into a maelstrom of what to you is the unknown uh, and that's and by in the process of undergoing that you know campbell would say you go through your rite of passage you become a hero uh, before you can return home and there is a clue here in that in that term that in a sense this is also an epic right uh, yes. socrates himself is being pulled into this journey this adventure of discovering what well what justice is right? absolutely and most people familiar with a little bit of plato will probably approach him first by learning the allegory of the cave sure uh, yeah. right uh -huh. uh, which is in book seven uh, of, of the republic it's what that's the motif of uh, descent a transformation and, and return but um, as, as you're saying Plato is I think um, after uh, not simply just um, telling stories uh, or, or allegories uh, there's there's more to it uh, than that all right now let's we'll, we'll come back to maybe some more of the rhetorical intent here but let's ask this question of justice which we're after what does this have to do with justice uh, well, I think there's two things that we can take away from those opening lines. Uh, so, a uh, first question I'm going to ask you is, where are they going to? I went down. So, we, we established that image. We got past the first one. Mm -hmm, we did, yeah. <laughs> okay. But where are they going to? Well, they're going to a festival yep. uh, to pray to a goddess. Oh, but but, but uh, geographically. Oh, where geographically, are where yeah, are, so are they descending to? to? Yeah. Well, it's like the port, isn't it, or something? Yeah, like, yeah. The yeah. It's a port of Athens. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, and okay, so um, and as you mentioned, yes, of course. Why are they doing that? Well, there's this uh, festival. It's important place where things come and go, you know. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, now um, back to our question of justice. Remember Socrates, right? He's been put on trial. Does anyone remember why? Why is Socrates put on trial? For corrupting the youth and blaspheming the gods, introducing strange new gods. That's right. Uh -huh. And so here, um, this introducing new gods, well, what are the Athenians doing in this scene? Well, they're, they're praying yeah. to a whole new god. This is the first, right. the first annual festival. This is its first year. Yeah, okay. So there's novel gods and Socrates has gone to pray to one. So, so they're doing just the same, are they not? Uh, uh, and so celebrating you got and meaning the notion of justice and injustice uh, is implicit in these, these opening lines just beneath the surface uh, uh, layer. Now, second takeaway is Plato's inviting us, beckoning 
challenging us uh, to also dive into the text, to have our own catabasis, if you will. Uh, so in other words, we're not just going to learn about justice. It's not something, as you mentioned earlier, we're not just going to read these tombs, right? This something has to be recognized uh -huh. and, and lived out. Now, for Plato to recognize something, to know something, he's going to give you the benefit of the doubt. That means you're also going to do it. Uh, you're you're going to yes. live in accordance with it. So, but this is the idea. We need, we're going to be transformed in how, uh, it, well, that's the true sense of uh, what he means by dialogos, right? Or by dialogue. Mm. Some are just getting more words uh, and, and knowledge, uh, but this, is, this uh, movement within our own very selves is going to happen. All right. Now, with that in mind, let's, let's see if we can see where justice is brought up once again. So the text continues on. When we had finished our prayers and viewed the spectacle, we turned in the direction of the city. And at that instant, Polymarchus, the son of Cephalus, chanced to catch sight of us from a distance as we were starting our way home and told the servant to run and bid us to wait for him. The servant took hold of me by the cloak behind and said, Polymarchus desires you to wait. Uh, okay, so uh, it's, huh? it's, it's, it's getting dramatic now. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, notice the action here. So again, Socrates is the, the eye, the speaking of the first person. He's arrested, so to speak, by Polymarchus. Now, Polymarchus, uh, maybe they're worth mentioning, uh, they're, they know each other, okay, so they're uh -huh. friends. But his name means uh, Lord, uh, Lord of War, essentially. There's mm -hmm. one way you could translate yeah. it. Arcus would be uh, Lord or Ruler uh, and, uh, of War. Okay. Now, he's also an arms dealer. Okay. So so he has a number of, uh, quite a few slaves uh, who help build, uh, make shields and so forth. So he's an arms dealer in, in, in the wars, in Paul Peter's wars. Now, here, um, so you can imagine this is not just a another Socrates okay so another um, yes, yeah. uh, philosopher who's uh, you know uh, itinerant right so uh, here he, rather he would be this imposing figure and the servant there tells him wait now just a few lines later you skip a line a little bit um, the question's gonna arise well why should we <laughs> okay mm -hmm. we had some plans here you're mm -hmm. telling me uh, to, to stop okay and so um, here is the response uh, that that we get uh, but do you see he rejoined how many we are are you stronger than all these for if not you will have to remain where you are so in other words yeah he's like well you and what army well actually no the army is here <laughs> okay uh -huh. so I'll show you the people you can't you tell we outnumber you there's uh -huh. just a handful of you like well, you're not gonna be able to oppose us if we restrain you uh, now, Socrates, very thoughtful here, says, May there not be an alternative, <laughs> I said, that we may persuade you to let us go. And now, um, Socrates is persuaded. Uh, he actually uh, is persuaded to join them. It turns out uh, there's a torch race on horseback in later that evening in honor of the goddess. Uh, and it's not to be missed, so Socrates agrees uh, to go with them. Now, that brief exchange encapsulates, I would argue, uh, the basics of justice, civic, uh, in Latin for polis, uh, where we get political life. So the basics of justice, civic, political life, and, and how do we deal with conflicting desire? Right? Who determines what's going to happen? Uh -huh. So, for instance, do you have dinner plans this evening? Yeah, yeah, I'm planning on, you know, uh, actually my wife called earlier to make okay. sure because uh, she wasn't sure where I'd put the uh, the chicken broth. Oh, all right. Yeah. And uh, I was pretty sure I'd left it in the pantry. But it turned out it was on the, the kitchen table. Uh, but she's cooking. She's preparing some risotto for me. So my plan is to go home and, uh, and dine with her, you know. All right. So what if a colleague, though, just towards the end of the day says, hey, Mr. Fawcett, let's put those plans on pause. Uh, I really, really want to go to this fine restaurant just down the road. Will, will you join me? Uh, well, I mean, I guess, first of all, I'd say probably no. Like, you know, my wife and family are more important to me. Maybe we could go some other time. But tell me more about this place. I mean, you know, yeah. how expensive is it? And, you know, yeah. like, what do they who's serve? Paying? Who's and who's paying? paying? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Can my wife come? Is it one of, yeah, and is it one of those burger places where it's all brick wall, exposed brick, and you sit on stools, and they serve it in newspaper to look cool, and it <laughs> yeah. costs you $30? You know, like, let okay. me know what I'm signing up for first, right, right. you know. Okay, before. all right. Well, now let's say it's, it's, it's uh, your boss. Or better yet, 
your boss's boss. So the superintendent now says, hey, Brett, I really need something important. Can we, can we talk over dinner? Can we change your mind? Well, if you're blessed to have a, a very reasonable and friendly and wise superintendent, he's oh, probably open to reason. <laughs> yeah, and I would probably say, but isn't there another alternative that I can persuade you to uh, do this some other evening? Or uh, yeah. or we could talk perhaps now. Maybe I'll buy you lunch right now. I would try to reason my way as, as frantically as I could out of it. Uh, uh, or if he prevailed upon me and said my job was on the line, maybe I'd have to message my wife and say, "Hun." I'll be late for the risotto. You start without <laughs> yeah. me. I'll have the leftovers. Let's say some for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, now the question is, with your conflicting desires, whose, whose will will prevail, right? Is it the will of the stronger? Okay. We're going to meet uh, Thrasymachus here uh, as we go. Uh, maybe it's argumentation. So on one level, that could be rhetoric. Uh, and so the okay. sophists were uh, famous for this, uh, just giving reasons, right? Or perhaps uh, maybe it's appeal to reason, which might be something more along uh, the lines of Immanuel Kant. Uh-huh. And it is understanding of politics, following what's rational. Uh-huh. Okay. Which, I sh- which to just to follow up on the classical education thing, yep. that's why the trivium, the basis of classical education, started with grammar, then moved into logic, so you could learn to reason, and then oh. culminated in rhetoric. Uh, right. Because uh, on its own, logic isn't always persuasive. You need rhetoric, but rhetoric on its own can be uh, sophistic. Right? Oh, the sophists, right. of course, were the, yes. the pay- philosophers for hire who would train you how to make a persuasive argument for any made-up thing. Uh, yeah. But no, you need to ground that in uh, reason in the first place, which in turn needs to be grounded in the grammar of the universe. So, okay. Uh, so, so, so yeah, you could, you could go right to rhetoric. Um, but you know that rhetoric should be grounded, as you're saying, uh, in logic. Ultimately, is certainly be Socrates' hope and as ideal. You know, L- lest we just become uh, great advertisers, <laughs> right? And marketers. Precisely. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, right. So now uh, there's a third possibility. So it's not just appeal to force or will uh, that will prevail. It's not on simply just. Uh, reason or, or argument there's a third possibility there's maybe some higher principle which we both reverence mm-hmm. right which we can uh, appeal to and this is symbolized here in this exchange by the goddess right um, so so that can maybe there is a higher principle that can guide our social group mm-hmm. okay now um, here these uh, it could be more lofty questions than uh, simply a meal plans uh, here. Let's say we're back in Athens. Are we going to blow the budget on a new defensive wall? What do you think? Uh, maybe. Oh, no. Are we going to go to war with Sparta, or should we sue for peace? That's a very important question mm-hmm. to ask. Very topical. Uh, yeah. What if there's a plague that breaks out? Oh, that would never happen. <laughs> what should we do? Mm-hmm. Maybe we can isolate. Okay. And if, you know, and if somebody doesn't want to isolate, we can say, well, there's so many more of us than there are of you. What are you planning on doing about it? What right. if Socrates objects? That's exactly, right. Yeah. If re- refuses to comply, mm-hmm. then what? Mm-hmm. Okay, so whose will will prevail? Now, uh, again, we're suggesting here that Plato's beckoning, challenging readers to enter into this catabasis. And he wants us to think not simply as individuals, uh, but also as structures of society. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, ultimately, the structures of reality in which which all this is uh, grounded in uh, so again um, these are not two different concepts we would say the individual versus the group for Plato uh, in fact for him the individual soul is isomorphic that means its shape resembles that of which the ideal city should mm-hmm. be structured how it should be structured and the much of the Republic uh, is this uh, argument is, is Plato's laying it out that the soul is going to be reflected in the city and vice versa. And by city, we just mean polis. All right. So justice is then this one overriding concept that connects the individual to the polis or to the society. And beyond that, the society to the cosmos. So uh, rest of created reality. Uh-huh. And beyond that, to the divine realm. Right, the realm of the forms, our EDOs, mm-hmm. okay, the ideal world. And for, for Plato's uh, epistemology, epistemology just means literally what you stand on. Uh, so uh, his, the way he looks at knowledge and how we understand the world around us, um, for him, this, this, this is a realm of particulars. It's mutable. It keeps changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and so it's, it's not as 
uh, sure a foundation as the eternal realm. That's immutable, all right, uh, the realm above. Uh, all right, so that, that's, that's more or less how Plato views um, the individual soul and uh, what an ideal society might look like. All right. Did you want to jump in there? Or are you no, no, that's okay, okay. very comprehensive. Right. So, please. so okay. Now, um, for that, that's how. Um, now, not sorry. I can say this. Um, not everyone is going to agree, though, <laughs> okay. that the society, the city, should mirror the soul, or, or vice versa. Uh. In fact, most characters in the Republic um, don't see uh, uh, eye to eye with with Socrates on that. Uh, now, let's. I'll quickly go over some of the characters whom we meet. We've, we've mentioned Polymarchus. He's not actually the first character who gets a substantial dialogue. Uh, the first interlocutor is Cephalus, who happens to be Polymarchus's father. So once they are prevailed upon, Socrates goes uh, to their house. Now, Cephalus is old, okay? Uh, he's got gray hair, uh, or if he has any at all. But uh, and his name literally means uh, head. All right. Uh, so uh, you think of, um, I mean, maybe he's been around longer, so he's like taller or something like this, or his head sticks out more. Uh, uh, but he's also like the head of the household. All uh, right. Uh, okay. Now, and Socrates does in this dialogue make some rather pointed observations about his old age. Uh, he's he happens. Uh, Cephalus happens to be a successful, wealthy businessman as well. And um, part of this is. Um, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a few moves that, that uh, Socrates is making. Plato, you probably may know this. He was a wrestler uh, in his previous career. Oh, so was uh, his wrestling name, Plato. You're right. Yeah. Broad shouldered, you know. So okay, there you have it. So so, and what he's going to do? He's going to grapple with Cephalus. He's just warming him up here a little bit, making fun of him. And in the end, he's going to be thrown out, and he never returns. So tradition, if you like, is 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 going to be upended as Plato introduces his. Uh, new unconventional republic all right now how does speaking of convention how does Cephalus define justice well probably like most of us with gray hair or maybe been around longer maybe more financially sta uh, stable might define justice pay your debts to those to whom they're owed <laughs> right think of someone who lends out money or something like this so Mind your own business and fulfill your obligations. That would be just. Oh. Now, that seems reasonable, does mm -hmm. it not? Yeah. What, what do you think? Well, and, and that's Cephalus for you, right? He's not a philosopher. He's, I think we all know guys like this. He's an older guy. He's, he's worked at his job a long time. He's been done yep. well at it. So for him, that's, that's what he thinks is a pragmatic approach to life. Yeah, mind your own business. And you know, if you owe somebody something, pay it back. And that, and the wheels of uh, the world will keep on turning, and uh, and everything will turn out fine for you. Yeah, on the if you want to live a life like uh, Cephalus, maybe that's all you need. Who knows? Right. Well, what do you right. think? Well, Socrates makes his point. Well, do you really give to others what they're owed all the time? What if you have a friend who, in a drunken rage, is knocking at your door one night and he wants his weapons back? Yeah, you let you, let, you <laughs> borrow some weapons, and uh, he wants them back now. Right, and I mean, his son is a uh, arms dealer, so exactly, this, this yeah. wouldn't be a foreign concept necessarily. Uh, but uh, the idea is, well, hold on a second. This guy's going to take his weapons, go out and murder someone. Are you sure that's really just? So, sorry, just, well, no, no. And they're his weapons, so don't you owe it to him to give it back to him? You're supposed to repay what people lend you, right? Ah, right. But yeah. this would not, yeah, so would that be just, right? Mm. And sorry, just suggest, of course not. It would not be in this case. So... Again, as a wrestler, he's throwing out uh, Cephalus, and the head is removed. So who steps up next? Well, it's the son. Okay, who else would step up next? Uh, and so he is the opposite of his father in many ways. So he's not really just a chip off the old block. He's young. He's ambitious. He's full of vigor. And he comes up with a, a fascinating definition, which... I think any adolescent, uh, certainly junior high student, <laughs> might come up with it's something like this: do good to your friends, and harm your enemies. <laughs> okay, uh, I gotta love that definition, right? Very uh, arms dealer definition for sure. Yeah, yeah. So whoever you uh, your allies are, uh, you know, you're gonna help them out. You're gonna you're gonna bet them. But if you have 
opponents to harm them. That's justice. Yeah. Here's to those who wish us well, and those who don't can go to hell. <laughs> there you go. Gotcha. Should we, we're going to drink to that? No, no. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we're not we're getting carried away with... Uh, uh, Paulie Marcus here. That is true. <laughs> but, okay, are there any problems with this? Now, this one might be a little easier to... Uh, some flags might, might emerge right away. I don't know. Can you think of any problems with that? Oh. <laughs> um, well, as a, my, as a Christian, my conscience is immediately, mm. uh, you know, bristling at this. Okay. You know, you're supposed to love your enemies. Right, right. right. And, and pray for those who curse you. But, you know, I'm trying to subtract from that. Uh, <laughs> I... Uh, <laughs> who are who? Who is my? I, I sort of think of what Jesus says. You know, who is my neighbor? I kind of think, well, who is my enemy? <laughs> oh, okay, let me count them. Uh, yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, for sure, Paul and Marcus, you probably could count your enemies. Mm -hmm. And he does have a grisly demise in in his in, in real life. Uh, but in any case, uh, he he's young and ambitious. Uh, and perhaps we might have some listeners out there who want to become politicians lead their polis uh and maybe you know uh, reward those who support you once mm -hmm. you do get the reins of power uh and uh keys to the kingdom right and the question though the socrates is going to ask you is are your friends good <laughs> are your enemies bad uh, right you might have bad friends right or supporters uh right um whom you shouldn't actually help but you might have good enemies Right, uh -huh. that need to be helped. Uh, okay, they need to be heard as well. Okay, so th this is the third uh, character now steps up, uh, and this is Thrasymachus. Now, Thrasymachus is a strident opponent of Socrates. Perhaps Polymarchus and Calphilus were, were not substantial enough. Well, uh, Thrasy uh, Thrasymachus is also a sophist. Uh -huh. Okay, and he's been waiting in the wings for most of book one of the uh -huh. Republic, and now he takes stage. Uh -huh. And he's in some some have likened him to uh, Socrates as doppelganger uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. sorts because he's like his alter ego. He's yeah. also a teacher. Uh -huh. He knows about justice, uh -huh. and uh, for him, justice is uh, whatever is good for the strong, uh -huh. right? And and so rules are made for and by the ruling class. Mm -hmm. Now, just to put a time out here, the pauses for a second, I kind of like this definition okay. <laughs> when it comes to parenting. Uh, because <laughs> uh, it's like, yeah, why should I listen to you? Because I'm your dad mm -hmm. and I made up the rules, right? Um, for now, at least, physically stronger. I'm maybe not for much longer, <laughs> but it's... Uh, uh, maybe they gang up on me, they could actually overpower me. But uh, in case, when you have that many kids, as Dr. McClarney <laughs> has, then yes. Yeah, so yeah just, it just takes one or two. They could prevail upon you like uh, Socrates' yeah. uh, friends. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But those who know me well, it doesn't take much. Just a four-year-old can <laughs> twist my little, with her little pinky. Uh, it's <laughs> good. But in any case, um, can change all the rules, break all the rules, right? Okay. Now, um, for the Simicus, though. Uh, going beyond, and I guess I'll make this point, is, yeah, justice is going to operate a little bit differently outside your household because you might have other <laughs> houses when they come into conflict. That, that doesn't work, right? Uh, so you can't just yeah. make rules for your house and expect other houses are going to follow the same rules you come up with. But for Thrasymachus Th here, justice is, and obeying the rules, it's really for the gullible, right? Uh, it's for all the suckers out there. Um, for him... The, the true ruler is one who has the courage to act unjustly, <laughs> all right? Yeah. So you don't act for the good of the flock, right? Uh, you don't act on behalf of the sheep. Uh -huh. You act for the shepherd, uh -huh. okay? That uh, is, is, is justice, right? Justice is for the ruler. And so, if you go back and listen to our podcast on international realism, uh, I, I would suggest he's uh, deliberately echoing the Malayan dialogue. Right? Uh, the, yes. Because the, yeah. the Peloponnesian War, as you've mentioned, is, is still fresh in people's minds. Yeah. And uh, that was a, a discussion that was had with the people, the Malayan people, is, well, you should really, you know, you should do, make a treaty with us because, you know, well, otherwise we're going to wipe you out. And it's really in your best interest just to save yourself. And justice doesn't really play into it. Uh, go back and listen to that yeah. episode where uh, we critique that. Uh, but it's still a you know it's still a prevailing attitude among a yep. lot of uh, theorists and politicians today. A lot of sure. people still are uh, uh, followers of this way of thinking. 
right? exactly because because all, along this line of thinking is that just as, as if you're going to follow the rules, well, you're a fool first of all, mm-hmm. or weak, um, and and uh, it's really it's a tool. Justice is a tool. Nice guys come last. Uh, rules and judicial apparatuses uh, of the state are just to your advantage, or whoever controls the state, uh, essentially. Now, and yes, I 100% agree with you. That's that's how a lot of um, uh, appar- states are set up to operate like that. Uh, and some, some people say, well, yeah, of course they are. Um, okay, um, now, as the discussion goes on, Thrasymachus realizes he blushes, actually, at his defense of the tyrant uh, and the unjust life. He uh, becomes shamed by the fact of his position, uh, as, as, it, as Socrates is, is able to point out to him. And here, um, is, again, this is not just some ancient uh, conversation that's going around a, a table. Uh-huh. Thinkers like Hobbes uh-huh. and, and Marx... Uh, they pick up on these ideas. They're not the only ones, but for Hobbes, really, all that we want in life is power, mm-hmm. okay, uh, or at least or protection from people in power. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's his uh, kind of his anthropology. We're like wolves, uh, uh, really, um, mm-hmm. and, and so we want we want to dominate others, or we need protection from those who might dominate us. Uh, so that's one way of looking at what justice is. It's just whoever has the most force or the longest teeth uh, or most powerful jaws. Now, uh, Marx, uh, on the other hand, he's going to take it at a different angle. He's going to say, yeah, you know that ruling class? Well, what they do is they make up the rules. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Forget this. Uh, there's no idios. Uh, that's that's Plato's term for form or for uh, the ideal. There's, there's no ideal justice. Mm-hmm. What is there? Brute. Class, yeah, class yeah. struggle, basically. Yeah, well, yeah. Is, is it there's economic power. Power. Mm-hmm. That's right. It's all about power. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so, and Nietzsche as well, right? That morality is just like it's what you use to make slaves obey you, basically. Uh, that's what slave morality is, you know. Exactly. Yeah, and, and and for Machiavelli, we get there. Um, he I mean, he sets the stage for Hobbes as well as Marx. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he gives the uh, the ruler or the prince the playbook for achieving just that mm-hmm. power. Yeah, right. Okay. So, um, are there drawbacks? Uh, any weaknesses in these lines of thought? Um, <laughs> the one that students usually uh, will latch onto, but point out the weakness very quickly, is Nietzsche's uh, will to power, uh, because uh, it works. But for like one kid in the class, because if he has all the power, then well, that makes us serfs essentially. Um, so it, it doesn't uh, work that well uh, if there's a few people in the room uh, who who want want the same thing at least. So, um, how can society function if its basis is power, right? Now, mm-hmm. Plato wonders uh, aloud. I mean, if we were a band of thieves, right, we would expect at least honor amongst us. Among thieves, yeah. Yeah, right? Because, I mean, say we go around stealing from uh, anyone we, we, we can find to take advantage of, would we steal from each other? Should we make a deal about this? What do you think? <laughs> Well, I, we have to trust each other to at least adhere uh, to our own rules, you know. Okay, so no group then, uh-huh. no society or fraternity even of thieves uh-huh. can function without some clear overriding rules. Uh-huh. Right, okay. So now, how does Socrates end up defining justice? So, so how does that come together? Well, here uh, to... Um, some things up a little bit for him everything has to be ordered rightfully so so it has to be in the right place and why this is going to emulate uh the ideal realm so justice then is an emulation of the ideal uh, and, and mention i maybe do we mention this there's isomorphism uh between the soul and the city so what that means is the, the, the structure of the soul, a rightly ordered, is going to mirror the structure of the city, the polis, rightly ordered. So for Plato, the, the soul involves, it's a tripartite soul. There's the appetites, these are our, our desires which propel us forward. Uh, then we have the thumotic, 
um, aspect to our soul. This is like the, the heart or the will, if you like. It's what um, we wants us to be first. I, I mean, uh-huh. you... <laughs> You can't have a good sports team without some thumos. Okay, you're gonna, uh-huh. you're, you're you're never, rarely will you win. Maybe, uh, uh, by default. But uh-huh. uh, uh, or, or or being a soldier, or being an entrepreneur, or something. Or you know, it, it's uh, we, we we know it. It's that kind of gusto or that passion. There, you have yeah. to have that passion, which yeah, you yeah. get that word there as well for pathos. So that's the idea. Is yeah, that's the thumotic aspect of the soul. Very, very important. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and part of Plato's critique of what was before him, so of, of Homer in particular, is it was too exultant of the thumotic. Yeah. So the soldier uh, really was given too much pride of place and the glory of the battlefield. For him, there's, there's another layer to the soul, and that's the noetic, or the noose. Uh, and, and so this is the, the realm of, of reason, of ideas, the mind. And a properly ordered soul will be the seat of reason will govern it. Mm-hmm. So it won't be the pride, um, the thumotic desire, the heart that will lead, nor will be our base appetites that guide us, uh, as we see with, with animals and instinct, just following them. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead, the rightly ordered soul is going to be uh, governed by reason. Now, the society has to be structured the same way. On the base level you have, well, your workers. Uh, essentially, they're the producers that get the goods put together. The next layer, well, obviously the thumos is connected mostly with warriors, the soldiers, right? Uh-huh. The auxiliaries who, who are gonna protect the society, uh, uh-huh. defend it and, 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 and go into combat as called to. And above them, well, we have the guardians. Uh, they're the ones who are going to be the, the ground of reason, uh, and, and, and they're going to uh, be the source to, to guide and structure this society. That's right, the philosopher king ideal. That's right. And, and that's the famous line, is that uh, until philosophers rule as kings uh, in their cities, uh, it'd be, and, and, uh, the city will have no rest from evils. So uh, you, basically what you have to have is they need to... Uh, the kings need to become genuine philosophers, essentially, mm-hmm. and the philosophers need to become kings. Um, otherwise, we'll have no rest from evils. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so um, hold on to your education, everyone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At least if, you're, uh, if we're going to get into a platonic uh, republic. Uh, and why? Again, because it's not simply that they're just like the, the think tank or the brain trust that uh, we're going to scheme like these great plans and then we'll send them down uh, to, to the auxiliaries and then the, the producers. The idea Plato has here is that um, it's always oriented towards a higher purpose, right? So that that is what what's justice. So it, it is stratified. It's specialized uh, city that, that he envisions. And it's also meritocratic, um, right? So it's one that requires self-discipline, uh-huh. control, uh, in order to know, well, what's best for everyone, right? Uh-huh. And, and to do what's best for everyone. So uh, how are we made virtuous? It's by, at a forensic level, uh, it's, it's ordering our own souls. And, and beyond that, how about the city? How is the city going to become just? Uh-huh. It's through properly being properly structured. And, and again, just as the noose will help guide, it will be here, philosophers, I mean, uh, that are going to guide uh-huh. the city. So that, that's, that's a quick uh, uh-huh. snapshot of, of, of Plato. And the novelty and there was yeah. that like, the pre-Socratic philosophers, at least, didn't really talk that much about morality. They, they sort of confined that to the world of opinion, right? Uh, or, or culture, right? right. Nom- nomos, law, yeah. right? Uh, what was the, you know, which is how some people today think, right? The, the universe is real, but you know, morality, that's just a subjective thing. It differs from culture to culture. Right, um, it's conventional. But they agree, but they certainly held that there was an order to the universe. The, the atoms, you know, were ordered in a certain way, and that's how the world was able to function. Uh, what Socrates yeah. and Plato do is say, it's true, yeah, there is a, there's an organizing rational principle in the universe, uh, but that's actually, and, and it's a law, you know, it, that actually is a kind of natural law. Uh, and there's also a natural law for our own flourishing. And just like the universe has to be structured, uh, we have to be properly structured. Uh, we have to make sure that our uh, reason is ruling over our actions uh, and that we do have a healthy thumos, a healthy spirit, because, uh, uh, you know, 
sometimes if you just think a lot about how you should be a good person, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. you know, so you can't really will yourself into that, right? Doing it. Yeah. yeah, you've got to, you know, you've also got to develop like ha virtuous habits, right? And that's part yeah. of Aristotle, obviously, but certainly he thinks, you know, the, the, your spirit needs to be involved, right? You have to have that animation yeah. and that otherwise your, you know, your desires will rule over you. You want to have you want to have spirit that controls your passions, and you want to have reason that controls them, and that'll make you a you know, as we might say today a well-rounded person, right? You're a well-integrated person who's uh, uh, you know has healthy desires, but healthy desires that are kept in check. That's also brave and strong, but ultimately is rational, and reason is governing all your decisions. And if that's what it takes for an individual to be uh, virtuous, to be rightly ordered, or rightly organized, just like the universe is rightly organized, yeah. so also should the city, the polis. Should also be rightly organized and structured so that it works and functions. It's basically taking that principle from Democritus and others and applying it to morality, right? And, say, and, yeah. and therefore saying, no, no, morality is objective and it has to do with the right functioning of you and of the world, just like science does in some sense. Right. So, so the morality is not simply this separate um, category we talk about here and then. Um, rather, it's it's integrated or integral to the material world the the life around us and so you have uh i would just say this, think of it as, as as russian dolls in some ways mm -hmm. or the well the scala natura uh but yeah, you, the, the great chain of being yes yeah, right so you have the individual but connected to the individual or as we expand out as individuals we form a society this mm -hmm. is not simply accidental <laughs> all right uh the society is actually the um is natural to us uh and, and so we're not making up these random rules or something like this uh, but rather there is a better way to order uh, or not to order or to be disordered in a society so okay you have the individual you have the society beyond that you have the cosmos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and and, and beyond or the, you know the creator realm the order and beyond that you have the ideal realm, the eternal realm. Mm -hmm. So all those uh, uh, go together. At the, at the end of the Gorgias, uh, the, Plato has this fascinating discussion on the blessed realm, right? Uh, and, and the aisle that uh, the, the, the souls that go to, it's not some tack on to the end of Gorgias. He says, oh, I know some people are gonna write this off as old wives tales and mm -hmm. they're, they're gonna dismiss this, but I think they're true, mm -hmm. says Plato. And he's on to something um, that, so, uh, that we're not simply um, making things up conventionally. Now, okay, that point might be important to make for our, where we go next uh -huh. with, with Machiavelli. And if we keep that in mind, where I think we did we mention this, where the prince is much shorter than um, the uh, ten and a half hour republic uh -huh. <laughs> because he has a reduced vision of, of reality. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, what, what that all entails. So uh, I think that's um, probably where we could leave off for this count. Unless you, do you have any other um, questions about that or thoughts? Well, uh, no, I don't think so. Other other than to say, I, I just, I've always thought it's interesting that nowadays, how would you say this? You, you know, there's the superficial, there's the kind of general opinion you should be a good person. But the people who think they're really clever are the ones who say, oh, no, I've seen through it. I'm a yeah. philosopher. And it's all fake, right? It's all just a tool mm. to control you, man, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and they're not totally wrong, like in terms of, you know, the world's morality or the way it functions. But that perspective is put right at the beginning of the Republic and is just refuted before before getting into the real philosophy. Right? It's, yes. just, it's just so easily, I mean, to the point where he's blushing, as you mentioned, right? right. Uh, so it's, it's almost like he's the fake Socrates. And I feel like a lot of uh, yeah. that, that thinking today, that kind of despairing nihilism about... Um, about morals and about politics uh it's similar it's just kind of it, they seem like they're socratic oh i'm i'm just asking questions i'm not accepting what society tells me i'm a, I'm a real gadfly yeah. but no really all that really does actually in fact and this is interesting because he's a sophist right his job yeah. is actually to be hired by the ruling and the powerful right to justify their work and i think that's what that nihilism does it actually kind of paralyzes people from being galvanized right. into morality and into well, helping bring about the kingdom of God. And Socrates uh, is not interested in that and shows that it's complete nonsense right in the first few pages of this book. Right? It's not like it takes a whole book to disprove this. It takes a couple of paragraphs yeah. into that. Um, and yet that's essentially the position Machiavelli will take. Right? It's to yeah. unpack that position over the course of well, his whole canon in some ways, as we'll discuss. So yeah. I just think that's very interesting, you know, that 
Machiavelli is a footnote to Plato, uh, and a, a footnote that uh, should come early on as a position that Plato refuted before he got into his real, <laughs> the real hard work of defining what justice was. Right. Yeah, as opposed to a power play, right? Mm-hmm. As our, our morality, at least, as as a power uh, a function of, of, of a tool, right? For Absolutely, power. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, will we uh, conclude with a prayer then? Absolutely. Uh, let us pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you sent to this world your Son, the light of the world, to give us new life. We thank you for this great revelation of what it means to be human, what it means to be a son, a daughter of the Most High. We pray for your grace of your Spirit to guide us in virtue and faith and hope and love. Then we give glory to your name and so better love you and our neighbor. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. St. Isidore, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.